Dr. Lerma, thank you so much for joining us. I'm sorry about some of the confusion. Um, so thank you everyone for uh, joining us again. Uh, I'd just like to introduce our speaker today. Um, we have Dr. Lerma here who earned his Doctor of Medicine from the University of Santo Thomas Faculty of Medicine and Surgery in Manila, Philippines. He completed residency training in internal medicine at UIC Mercy Hospital and Medical Center, where he also served as chief resident. He completed a fellowship in nephrology and hypertension at Northwestern Memorial Hospital, the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University, and the Veterans Administration Lakeside Medical Center in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Lerma is a diplomat in the subspecialty of nephrology with the American Board of Internal Medicine. He has authored more than 100 peer-reviewed publications and presentations. Notable publications include Current Diagnosis and Treatment, Nephrology and Hypertension, Nephrology Secrets, Hypertension Secrets, and Henrik's Principles and Practice of Dialysis. At present, he holds the rank of Clinical Professor of Medicine with the Section of Nephrology at University of Illinois at Chicago. He serves as the Educational Coordinator for Nephrology with UIC Advocate Christ Medical Center. Aside from being active on social media, he is also the KDIGO Knowledge Translation Lead. Dr. Lerma's research interests in include CKD, hypertension, diabetic kidney disease, and dialytic therapies. Thank you so much, Dr. Lerma, for joining us today. Thank you very much for that uh, wonderful introduction. Again, I, I apologize for uh, uh, uh this uh miscommunication i i was getting ready to log on at 11 30 <laughs> uh and i guess i'm looking at central but anyway now i i know dr armitage uh, mentioned about uh saying a joke and and here i go with my joke okay so i i did my training at northwestern and my mentor dr murray levin uh told me this uh the first day i started as a fellow and he told me you know edgar the most important specialty in the world is nephrology and i said well dr levin um how about the heart isn't the heart more important than the kidneys and he said no the heart is a prenephric pump its job is to supply blood towards the kidneys makes sense so i said how about the gastrointestinal tract and he said, oh, that's just to supply nutrition for the kidneys. So as a young, eager fellow, I tried to do my best to try to trump this guy. And I said, I thought I finally had it. I said, well, how about the brain? Obviously, God put the brain on top of all the other organs because it's the most important organ. He paused for a while and he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you know, Edgar, the brain is there to tell you when to go to the john. So with that said, uh, today I'm going to talk about approaches to prevent and treat chronic hyperkalemia. However, I would start off by talking about hyperkalemia. Um, and these are my disclosures. And the question uh, which we'll answer at the end of this talk is which of the following agents for hyperkalemia binds potassium in exchange for hydrogen and sodium in the gastrointestinal tract? thereby increasing fecal excretion of potassium. Is it A, sodium polystyrene sulfonate, also known as SPS or kayexalate? Uh, is it B, pateromer, also known as veltasa? And is it C, sodium zirconium cyclosilicate, now called lokelma? So um, today, um, I'm going to discuss the epidemiology of hyperkalemia. I'm going to talk about the current standard of care methods of hyperkalemia management. I'm going to describe the mechanisms of the novel oral potassium binding agents. And lastly, I will discuss some of the published literature, current clinical use, and potential future applications. So let's start off by um, talking about epidemiology. So I, I wanted to start by drawing on the tools of epidemiology to help us identify those patients that might potentially be at greatest risk for hyperkalemia and those who may need our most attention. So in thinking about how one defines this problem in a population, I actually came up with several challenges. And the first challenge is actually, which is the definition of hyperkalemia? At first, it may seem like perhaps a no-brainer, Right? As we know what hyperkalemia is, however, the fact of the matter is that when studying it in a population, many authors have actually used 
entirely different and discrepant definitions. The challenge is how we're going to combine this data. For instance, it could be above the upper range for that given lab. Of course, that can differ between different institutions and different hospitals. Alternatively, one can use a potassium level of over 5.5, and this has been commonly used, over six perhaps. But thinking about it really, why does it even have to be an even number or a round number? Why not 5.9 or 6.3? Then the next question that comes up is, do or is it okay in a population to use a single measure of hyperkalemia or do we need confirmatory values? And we're all aware about the effect of laboratory sample preparation and the effect of even small amounts of hemolysis from phlebotomy causing fake or pseudo hyperkalemia. But there's also a lot of minute to minute and hour to hour with person variation in the potassium level. And what might be 5.6 an hour later without any change could be actually 5.3. Another question that comes up and another challenge one is faced with when trying to summarize this data is the market relationship of the frequency of hyperkalemia on GFR. Of course, one of the major risk factors is lower GFR. And so when looking at different studies, you'll come up with vast differences in the frequency estimates and the estimates of the frequency of hyperkalemia because they have studied very different ranges of GFR. So I think this is where you really need to see the information stratified by GFR in an attempt to really understand and combine the, the information. And lastly, which I'll touch on in a couple of slides is, we take it for granted that a high potassium is bad, but in a population, how do we know that, how do we define it or quantify it? And what adverse outcomes beyond laboratory measure are we actually interested in? So is it real risk of all, or of all cause death? Is it cardiovascular death? Is it arrhythmic death? And if that's the case, are we looking at outcomes over years? Are we looking at outcomes tomorrow, within the next day? Or how about the next hour? And then more than, more than that, we want to know ultimately what are the intermediate processes between the recognition of hyperkalemia and the adverse outcomes? And is there a way that we can further stratify our patients to think about those who need even more than the usual or emergent or immediate care? So this will be the only physiology paper I'll present in my talk, but just as a reminder to us about what's supposed to happen when we're faced with potassium loading in states of health. So this is a study published from 2016 by Dr. David Ellison, citing much earlier research in healthy adults who were potassium loaded in the red bar here with 100 millimoles potassium chloride. And you can see what happens the urinary potassium excretion, of course, goes up, and it goes up very quickly within an hour, and then it goes up by more than sixfold. And that is accompanied by a more than doubling in the circulating level of plasma aldosterone. And so, of course, serum potassium will increase. In healthy adults, it will stay within the normal range, and then within four hours after the completion of the potassium load, it will start to come down and eventually return to the baseline level. We all know that this doesn't always work out this way in our patients. And there are several major reasons why it doesn't. The two most important reasons by far is the presence of low or very impaired glomerular filtration. And the second is the use of medications, which is either going to prevent the synthesis of aldosterone or block its action at the receptor level. So this was shown very nicely in a post hoc analysis of the AASK trial uh, being a randomized controlled trial in African-Americans with hypertension and they have non-diabetic nephrosclerosis. These patients were randomly assigned to a calcium channel blocker, beta blocker or an ACE inhibitor. And the first thing to note is that they stratified the risk of hyperkalemia by baseline GFR. This is the event rate of hyperkalemia as defined by a potassium of over 5.5 on study labs 
So those who were at highest risk are clearly those with the lowest GFR. That is less than 30. Whereas in this clinical trial setting, very few patients had with a GFR of greater than 50 developed any hyperkalemia. And then the next thing to note, of course, is that the risk of hyperkalemia is much greater even with each GFR group. Among those in the white bars here that were randomly assigned to the treatment with an ACE inhibitor, and it is additive to that. Now, for those with the lowest GFR and assigned to an ACE inhibitor, they had a 9.9% risk of hyperkalemia greater than 5.5. Now, th there are many reasons to think why the true risk would actually be much higher in real life. And of course, the first one is that these were non-diabetic patients. We know that diabetes is a major risk factor. And secondly, people who take part or volunteer for clinical trials are generally on average healthier and much more tolerant of study medications than the patients who actually present in our clinics or for whom some of these medications apply. So these authors went on to identify multiple risk factors which are relevant for our discussion. And ACE inhibitors compared to calcium channel blockers increased the risk of hyperkalemia by sevenfold in this clinical trial. Again, these are random assignments to the drugs. Women were half the risk of hyperkalemia than men. This is consistent with other studies that I'll show. And so we have identified another thing that men are at greater risk for. Older age was a risk factor. Lower GFR compared to GFR greater than 50. This study of non-nephrotic, non-diabetic patients found that modest proteinuria was also a risk factor for hyperkalemia. And they did a time-dependent analysis where they found that those who were being treated with diuretics, not for potassium lowering, but just as at the discretion of their treating physician, also were found to be at lower risk for hyperkalemia, 60% lower risk on a relative scale. Now, I mentioned that the overall risk as estimated in the study was likely to be a great underestimate of the risk of hyperkalemia. So here, another study examined the risk of hyperkalemia. Uh, and this is a paper that was published in 2009 and look at the National Veterans Health Administration data. And this cohort of over or nearly a quarter of a million people uh, in the National Veterans Health Administration database who had outpatient measures of estimated GFR. Here they define hyperkalemia using a more strict definition of at least 6.0. So this could be an inpatient or an outpatient. Uh, this is a clinical lab. This is not a study lab. And what I'm trying to show here is one thing, mainly that after adjusting for demographics and other comorbidities, the risk of hyperkalemia, if you had any CKD, GFR of less than 60, by outpatient was more than five times as great as the risk if you had no CKD. I want to note that the authors um, did not find that those who were on RAS inhibitors were at markedly different risk of hyperkalemia. Now, again, let me caution you, this is not a random assignment. And the authors think that this is likely confounding by indication whereby patients who were thought to be at higher risk or even if they had hyperkalemia in the past had their drugs either not used or withdrawn so this is not to say that in these patients, RAS inhibitors did not cause hyperkalemia. Now, other studies have looked at other specific subgroups of CKD patients. This is a nice study look, looking at what's called a low clearance subspecialty clinic. These are patients uh, referred with a GFR of less than 20. It is a multidisciplinary clinic for preparation for dialysis or transplantation. And this is the potassium level at the initial visit. That is when they were transferred or referred to the subspecialty clinic. And what is really marked here is that the risk of potassium 5.5 to 5.9, and as you can see, almost a quarter, it is 8.4% at the time of the initial referral 
had a potassium of at least 6.0. And then 31.5% had significant hyperkalemia, even at the time of referral. Now let's look at other studies. Uh, this study um, uh, looked at a more broad view and now we're looking at a general CKD clinic. So these are nephrology clinics, not general population, but these clinics look at a whole range of chronic kidney disease patients. This is a multi-center study in patients with a GFR of 25 among their patients. And about 40% of these patients were on an ACE inhibitor. At baseline, about 8% had hyperkalemia, here defined as potassium of greater than 5.5. So you know, you saw, you saw markedly less than the risk that was seen in the low clearance study I showed before. So this study did a couple of interesting things. One, they looked at the average potassium over years of follow-up, and they did not establish a single cut point but they wanted to look at the factors that predicted higher potassium on follow-up. And they found out that being a man, having diabetes, and being on a RAS inhibitor predicted on average or mean potassium that was higher. In contrast, having a higher GFR using diuretics and having a higher bicarbonate or CO2 on chemistry were predictive of lower potassium on follow-up. Beyond that, they were interested in the outcomes that were associated with potassium. So these are long-term outcomes, not the outcome on the day of the measurement of the potassium. They look at both deaths prior to end-stage kidney disease, end-stage kidney disease, and cardiovascular hospitalizations. And they grab the hazard ratios of these events as a function of the serum potassium at each time point in follow-up. So what you can see here for the outcome of death and cardiovascular hospitalizations, the lowest risk is really in this sort of sweet spot of 4.0 to 5.0. Even at a potassium of 5.4, the risk is measurably greater for death or cardiovascular hospitalization. And obviously it is markedly greater more than double with your potassium in the 6.0 range. This is different, by the way, in the relationship between potassium and end-stage kidney disease that they observed where hyperkalemia was not associated with a significantly greater risk in multivariate adjustment. But hypokalemia was, and I think that they are, there are a variety of interpretations of this kind of observation, but perhaps one, is that we need also to use caution not to pharmacologically lower potassium when we're treating potassium into the lower or even normal range. Now, here's another large study that looked at CKD patients, and these are patients in ambulatory care. Uh, as we know, in ambulatory care, most of these patients are not referred to nephrologists. So this was 36,000 patients from the Cleveland Clinic over many years, and you can see that their GFR was much higher than the CKD clinics that we just saw earlier. And there were multi-ethnic cohorts. So more than one in, one in eight were African-Americans. You could see these patients are older and only 11% had the hyperkalemia using a definition of potassium greater than 5.0 on follow-up. And these were the risk factors that they've identified. Again, male gender, low GFR. And interestingly, they've identified a differential relationship between BMI and hyperkalemia. So those with the lowest BMI were actually at higher risk for hyperkalemia. And one possible interpretation is the observation that skeletal muscle mass is actually a source of intracellular deposition for potassium. So after potassium loading. So when exposed to a potassium load, these patients with low muscle mass may simply have less place to put it while they're working on their renal excretion of that. Now, diabetics were also at higher risk and absolutely those who were on ACE inhibitors, uh, they were also at greater risk. I want to point out that 
as it, it is buried in this cohort and many others that they did not find a difference in the risk of hyperkalemia between African Americans and other ethnic groups. Uh, there is a debate in the literature on this, as we know. Uh, absolutely, the physiological literature does suggest that there is a difference in the potassium of handling, potassium handling and disposal between those of African American ancestry and other groups. But the clinical significance on this is still unclear, and most of the studies really have not found strong interracial disparities in hyperkalemia and in CKD patients. Now, we saw what happens if you give an ACE inhibitor, either a single agent or an ARB, and the risk is somewhere between 1.5 and 7-fold if you had CKD or developing hyperkalemia. So what happens, as the VA nephron alludes to, when you give dual blockade? That is, you block multiple sites of the RAS system, and this is a hypothesis that was tested for perhaps somewhat inadvertently in this trial. So most of us know that this is a completed trial, multi-center, double-blinded, placebo-controlled, and it was studied in patients with diabetic nephropathy and diabetics with, who had overt albuminuria, uh, 1,450 patients. And the authors in this study predefined hyperkalemia, not as an efficacy outcome for sure, but as a safety outcome. Uh, they defined it as any potassium during follow-up or of more than six or any potassium greater than 5.5 that required at the discretion of the treating physicians, emergency or hospitalized care. And they have a very extensive safety evaluation and safety monitoring so that every two weeks during drug titration, potassium must be measured and every three months during maintenance follow-up. And you could see this is difficult to replicate in a regular ambulatory clinic. Now, this study was stopped early, as reported several years ago, and one of the main reasons was an excess risk of hyperkalemia. The excess risk was 2.79, which is nearly three times as high in a dual RAS blockade group as compared to those who were on the ARB alone. Um, so here, um, not only was the hyperkalemia more common, it was also more severe in this analysis. And you could see here the dual therapy groups and the monotherapy groups, the peak potassium was much higher and they tended to be more likely require emergency department care. 69.4% were sent to the ED, a high percent of course was, hosp was hospitalized but only five of these patients require dialysis. Only, um, so these are the five patients who require dialysis. And they, these patients were also more likely on average to require immediate potassium lowering therapies such as calcium and insulin. And they were much more likely to require permanent discontinuation of the study medications, particularly RAS inhibitors. So both the difference in the risk and the difference in severity for these patients with diabetic kidney disease, GFR over 30 on dual RAS blockade. Now, again, we, we said that the safety monitoring board here was independent, felt that this, along with the other safety concerns, plus the lack of evidence of efficacy, was enough reason to discontinue the trial. Now, when you stratify by CKD stage, and then further by the severity of hyperkalemia, this is a potassium of at least 6.0. You see here uh, on, the, on the left side, uh, on the gray bar, and then less than 5.5 in the white bar, and then marked increase in the right, in the risk of one day mortality. So this is an odds ratio of 31.64, and you can see here the odds ratio of 8.02. So that's, the first thing to note is that the risk of death, if you are severely hyperkalemic, can quantify it at least. That is somewhere between 8 and 30 times greater. Now, you might also note that the height of the bar on the, on the right side is much different for those with stage 5 CKD. And there are a couple of interpretations. First of all, 
this is still 8.02 times. So there is as if you had a normal potassium, but there might be a relatively greater tolerance perhaps of hyperkalemia, even in those patients who had already advanced CKD. So that's one interpretation. The other interpretation is that if a patient has no CKD based on the GFR, when they develop a potassium of greater than six, there must be some severe acute illness, um, say a tumor lysis syndrome, or maybe a cardiogenic shock or septic shock. And so what we're really seeing is in part a difference in the relative severity of the underlying acute illness. But neither of these hypotheses that I mentioned could be tested in these studies specifically. A couple of papers, uh, which I'm just going to breeze through quickly. Uh, again, hyperkalemia associated with increased costs in hospitalizations and mortality, cardiovascular events, and ICU admissions. So how does this happen? You know, we, we teach our trainees and we've learned in our training that there's a variety of steps that occur between hyperkalemia and cardiac arrest. The first is the one being shown here, the speak T waves. Uh, these mark a repolarization abnormality if they're symmetric and seen across multiple leads. But can we quantify that? And is this a reliable intermediate indicator of impending cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrest? It turns out that this is a very hard thing um, to study, as you can imagine in this population. And a couple of studies that I wanted to highlight a bit, I've tried to do that. This one paper from about um, over a decade ago, 90 patients, inpatients, documented potassium of over 6.0, and they had EKGs performed clinically at the same time. The majority of these patients, sorry, so the majority of these patients actually had advanced CKD or advanced AKI. 12 of them developed arrhythmias, four had cardiac arrest, and then the authors went back and systematically graded the EKGs to define or identify new peak symmetrical T waves what they considered pathognomonic of T wave changes of hyperkalemia. And the results are shown here. Those who had peak T waves are in the gray bar and those without are in the black bar. And you could see even for this very high potassium of 7.2 to 9.4, the vast majority had no peak T waves. Now, 14 of these patients went on to either cardiac arrhythmia or cardiac arrest. One of those patients had a peak T wave as using the standard criteria, and only seven of them had any possible changes in the T waves that may be or could be interpreted as soft peaking. So the authors concluded that given the poor sensitivity and specificity of the EKG changes, there is no support for their use in guiding treatment of stable patients. So this is another study, and this is the last one I'll show. Uh, on this uh, topic, 242 patients from the University of Pittsburgh. And basically here in this study, um, what they discovered was that none of these patients, again, these were events occurring in a tertiary care hospital, none of these patients died as a direct result of hyperkalemia. Some of them did experience mortality, but unrelated, and the vast majority were successfully treated. So this included treatment uh, with dialysis, but at the time of hyperkalemia, less than 50% had any EKG changes suggestive of it, and only 36% had peaking of T waves suggestive of repolarization abnormalities induced by hyperkalemia. So to conclude, there's no question that hyperkalemia is a common problem, especially in advanced CKD, and patients with less GFR especially those on RAS inhibitors. Uh, these are the patients who are at risk. We also discussed the major risk factors, um, um, dual RAS inhibition, presence of diabetes, lower BMI, etc. So now when we talk about prevention and treatment of hyperkalemia, and this slide just shows you the acute treatment of hyperkalemia, and this will not be our topic. Um, what we're going to talk about is the management of chronic hyperkalemia. So what can we do to prevent hyperkalemia? To control excess potassium levels in the serum over a long period of time. 
And the obvious approach is to remove any modifiable costs, which is pretty much we can call the bread and butter of nephrology, right? And we see hyperkalemia in our patients. These are oftentimes feasible, but sometimes potentially undesirable, as I will show later on. So as you will see, as we go over each of these options, there are clinical scenarios where you may not want to choose that option, but you may have to be forced to deal with that. So I'm not going to go into the pathophysiology of hyperkalemia, but I'll just delve right into the treatment options. And this slide shows you the different medications that are potentially causing hyperkalemia. And some of these medications you can easily discontinue or probably switch to an alternative agent. But you run into problems with, say, RAS inhibitors, as well as the calcium urine inhibitors, which may be needed in transplants. Now, what is less known is that there may also be a survival benefit from being on RAS inhibitors. So as shown in this paper, matching those with uh, those or without treatment for RAS inhibitors, and you can see showing the significant survival benefits in patients who were exposed to RAS inhibitors. These were patients with prevalent CKD. And Usually, again, this continuation of breast inhibitors, unfortunately, maybe is what's going to happen. Uh, often, these are done by primary care physicians, but as nephrologists, sometimes we're guilty of this as well. And so this is a potentially undesirable trade-off where we sacrifice a potentially beneficial medication just so we can control potassium balance. So as we know, CKD is associated with a other various metabolic abnormalities, some of which of them exacerbate hyperkalemia, uh, like metabolic acidosis, uh, treatment of hyperglycemia. So <clears throat> another strategy that you could take is to increase potassium excretion. And the natural way of doing this is of course through the kidneys. So we have seen patients with decreased GFR and we can always nudge the kidney to excrete more potassium. And you can usually use diuretics for that. Obviously, if you have a patient who's volume overloaded, edematous or hypertensive, this is probably very useful and a necessary step in order to rebalance your potassium homeostasis. However, some patients may actually be euvolemic or even hypovolemic. In those cases, a diuretic may not be actually helpful, but rather counterproductive. And in those patients with advanced CKD, the effect of diuretics may be limited. The second possible strategy here is to stimulate the mineralocorticoid effects pharmacologically. To add a medication such as fludrocortisone acetate or glycerotinic acid, as I showed before, the effect of increased aldosterone level contributes to the excretion of potassium. So if you can do this, if you can pharmacologically stimulate your mineral corticoid, let's say in a patient who has hyporeninemic hypoaldosteronism, you could in fact enhance potassium excretion. And of course, the problem with it, this as we know is that if you actually believe in the benefit of press innovation, then you're doing the exact opposite by following an opposite strategy. So you could enhance sodium excretion, you could increase blood pressure, induce edema and fibrosis in the heart and the kidneys. So this may not be a strategy to follow routinely in all your patients. So how about diet? Again, another common strategy is to refer the patient to a dietitian to be educated about potassium restriction. And that there's a relationship between serum potassium concentration and potassium intake, which has been shown in multiple studies. Dietary potassium, as reflected by urinary potassium, correlates nicely with serum potassium concentrations. And also in dialysis patients, where you can measure estimated daily protein intake from urea nitrogen modeling, there's a very nice and very linear association between serum potassium levels and the amount of dietary protein intake. And you could limit 
protein intake. So you could limit certain types of foods in order to decrease the intake of potassium. Now we know that many potassium rich foods such as fruits and vegetables are also excellent sources of fiber, alkali and other micronutrients. Incorporating a diet low in potassium but sufficient in alkali and fiber can be a challenge. So this is important as metabolic acidosis, as we know, may potentiate hyperkalemia and contribute to further progression of kidney disease. Additionally, the increase in alkali, namely citrate and acetate, which accompany a diet high in potassium, may in turn reduce the risk for nephrolytiasis and may have important implications for bone health. Now, where the problem comes in is aside from the nice colors on this slide, what you'll notice is that, is that these are considered healthy foods. So if you take your foods that are rich in potassium, you may be taking the foods that a cardiologist might consider the most beneficial foods for somebody at high cardiovascular risk or hypertension. Now you can imagine a more high risk patient than those with CKD who virtually all of them have hypertension or at high cardiovascular risk. And when we restrict that, their potassium intake, in essence, we may be actually forcing them in a less healthy or unhealthy dietary pattern. Large observational cohorts have examined uh, diets which are low in potassium and incident CKD or the progression of CKD, but the results have been conflicting. So here in the slide, this is the PREVENT study, which actually um, used the low urinary potassium excretion as a surrogate of low potassium diet. And they showed that this low urinary potassium excretion or low potassium diet is associated with a higher risk for incident CKD. So the study showed that not high urine sodium excretion, but rather low urine potassium excretion was associated with the increased risk of CKD uh, progression. This is a recently published paper in JSON, a pre-specified analysis looking at 191 patients who were elderly, majority of were male uh, of European ancestry. And these patients were 83% um, were on RAS inhibitors, 38% had diabetes, and the GFR was... Um, uh, stage 3b to 4 CKD. So these patients were treated with 40 millimoles of potassium chloride per day for two weeks. And the authors concluded that in these patients with stage 3b to 4 CKD, increasing dietary potassium intake to the recommended levels with this potassium chloride supplementation actually raised the plasma potassium by 0 0.4 millimoles per liter. So this would potentially result in hyperkalemia in older patients or those with higher baseline plasma potassium. Now, again, we have to be cognizant uh, that there are health benefits of potassium. This was an, uh, there's a nice paper published by Dr. Palmer and Dr. Clegg, published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, where they showed um, several benefits of potassium decrease in blood pressure, decrease in risk of stroke, uh, so on and so forth. So again, by restricting potassium intake, we are faced with a potentially undesirable therapeutic compromise. Again, sacrificing something beneficial or healthy just in order to balance potassium. So whenever we see hyperkalemia, we, we use the, all of the um, all of the measures that I have mentioned. But we are nephrologists, right? <laughs> we reach for the big guns. So we always have dialysis in our back pockets, which we can apply to mo the most recalcitrant or severe cases of hyperkalemia. Yeah, I, I, I felt like this was like a Darth Vader and this is my army of uh, dialysis machines. Um, now I wanna show you this paper. This is an old paper published in AJKD, I believe in the 1980s. And by uh, this was written by the late Dr. Susan Howe from Loyola. And I like this slide because it helps to know what you can achieve in terms of a single dialysis session. And I'll, albeit this is only 11 patients, it was a nice crossover design whereby the authors quantified the amount of potassium removed in an average patient when applying potassium bats of two, 
one or zero. And as you can see, and maybe you might expect, zero potassium bat removed the most potassium, approximately 80 milliequivalents in one session, whereas 2.0 potassium dialysate removed about 50 milliequivalents in one session. So be aware of this when you treat your hyperkalemic patients. Somebody who might have missed several dialysis sessions may require several repeated measurements in order to rebalance their potassium amount. The problem with correcting potassium with dialysis, and here I'm talking about chronic management, is that in dialysis patients, this is our strategy. Our MO is concernedly solely with mass balance. What we're saying is that what goes in needs to come out. And as we do dialysis to remove a proper amount of potassium over a weekly period, every week, what we're not concerned with is this comes at the expense of ignoring electrophysiology pretty much because we're doing this treatment three times a week. And what we see is a pretty predictable seesaw pattern whereby pre-dialytically, we have a high and sometimes very high potassium, which prompts us to apply even lower potassium mass in order to achieve that desirable mass balance. And as a result, we'll precipitously drop the serum potassium levels during a very short period of time when we dialyze these patients and that this is repeated. And let's not forget, this is not happening in a vacuum. We have patients with a very high prevalence of left ventricular hypertrophy who may have hypomagnesemia, hypocalcemia, and even alkalemia. So this may be a hotbed for arrhythmias with or without the potassium fluctuations. Then the second qualm I have with our chronic dialytic management strategies is that proper prescriptions are not always applied in our chronic patients. When you have an inflation, you can check serum potassium pretty much daily or sometimes more than once a day. But how often do we check serum potassium levels in our chronic outpatient dialysis patients? Maybe once a month? Who's to say that the serum potassium that we're seeing is reflective of the patient's potassium every time the patient comes in for dialysis treatments throughout the month. And yet, we apply the same potassium dialysate every time, 12 times a month, and based on that single measurement once a month. Just to bolster the argument that our dialysis treatment may contribute to arrhythmias, there was this a small study that looked at arrhythmias incidents in the context of hours from starting dialysis. And as you can see, it sort of increased then peaked at about four hours, then gradually went down. And then in the wider interdialytic period, it went into sort of a baseline level. There may be indirect evidence that during the dialysis procedure, there may be increased risk for arrhythmias. I have to admit that the amount of information we have in this area is very, very scant. And we are very much in need of more information and more science. This is a paper that was published uh, recently, uh, you, whereby a low di potassium dialysate, 1.0, um, was associated with higher mortality, particularly in patients on dialysis and those with high pre-dialysis serum potassium. So in the end, we may end up using potassium binders and that there may be only one, uh, the, uh, this may be one of the fe more feasible strategies that we can apply. And so the one binder that we have been using for many years is Kayaxalate, right? Um, and I'll, I'll say that, um, you may or may not know that this is approved actually formally by the FDA in 1961 based on this study that nowadays probably would not pass muster. 22 hyperkalemic patients. Um, and bear in mind that this was in an era when dialysis was not yet readily available or at least routinely. So this was presented as a potentially life-saving intervention when nothing else is available. Now, you're looking at a study of 22 hyperkalemic patients. This paper was published in New England Journal of Medicine. I don't think you can publish a paper in New England Journal with this number of patients nowadays. Um, now, another concomitant trial on the same publication on the same issue in, uh, showed 10 hyperkalemic patients where they use a strategy of 
either giving SPS or kaexalate combined with sorbitol, sorbitol alone, or just the sorbitol and al the SPS alone. And the interesting finding is that here, SPS was effective in lowering potassium, and you see the individual, individual patients here. But interestingly, when they look at the sorbitol patients alone, lowering happened in that group also. In other words, inducing diarrhea may have had a good effect of also lowering potassium regardless of adding the SPS. Now, granted, this was in a total of three patients, so I don't know that we, how far we can go in conclusions regarding this. A more contemporary study published in 2015 in CJSEN, 33 patients, a European trial, and the SPS arm had a more successful lowering of serum potassium, again, of about one milliequivalent per liter as compared to placebo group and not unexpectedly. GI side effects were more common in the SPS group. Now the counterpoint is that SPS may not work alone. So given the studies that were presented, uh, I presented earlier, that's probably debatable. The study that is oftentimes used to argue against that is the study in six patients uh, with each group using placebo, resin, and then cathartic to affect serum potassium level. And there is no effect from any of the interventions. But what's worth noting is that this study, it was done in normal kalemic patients. These are not hyperkalemic patients. So the dynamics of colonic potassium transport and the effective binders may depend on the potassium gradient. And they may be present in only hyperkalemic patients. So I'm not sure that this study can be used to speak against the effectiveness of binders or cathartics either. Another issue to consider with SPS is the occurrence of colonic necrosis, which was demonstrated in this nice study from the Walter Reed Hospital of 123,000 adult inpatients. And the conclusion was that there was a clear association with SPS and colonic necrosis, but the risk was relatively small. It was 0.14% versus 0.07%. So almost double in those treated with SPS. What's nice about this study is that many of the patients actually had autopsies and pathologic findings to support that these were indeed related to SPS because they were able to show these SPS crystals in the areas of mucosal necrosis from those patients who succumbed to this condition. Now in 2019, uh, this study, uh, which is a large population-based retrospective cohort of uh, over 20,000 patients, elderly, who were prescribed SPS. And you could see here that there was a higher risk of adverse gastrointestinal events. Um, this is hospitalization or ER visit or intestinal ischemia um, or gastrointestinal ulceration and perforation or even uh, requirement for a resection or ostomy within 30 days of the initial SPS prescription. So all we had previously was SPS or kaexalate. So there is a clinical need for hyperkalemia treatments that are effective, safe, and well tolerated. So we arrive now at the novel agents that are available. Uh, and there are two medications. One is patiramer, the other one is CS. Both of these are novel binders, oral medications, neither of which are absorbed. Pateromer is a cation exchange organic polymer, and ZS is an inorganic microporous compound. And these two agents, obviously, uh, we're in a new era now. These agents underwent very rigorous testing for efficacy and safety in order to be approved, unlike SPS, more than 50 years ago. So I will briefly review with you the clinical trials that were performed in order to show such efficacy and safety. And I have to emphasize that these were based on biochemical endpoints. So it's showing the efficacy and safety of correcting potassium and controlling it over a fairly longer extended period of time. And without going into too much details, I wanted to show that there are at least four randomized controlled trials with pateromer, 
uh, the total number of patients is upwards of 600 in these trials. And this is just a timeline of the different patellar trials. I'm not going to discuss all of them. So I'm just going to pick on a few of them. And this one um, is in patients who were hyperkalemic on spironolactone who were randomized to patiromer versus placebo, showing that the patiromer group here was more successful in maintaining normal kalemia despite even uptrade or despite uptrading the dose of spironolactone. So it proved the concept that you were able to maintain a RAS inhibitor and even increase the dose in patients who were prone to hyperkalemia in the face of such treatment when treated chronically. And this was for one month with this binding agent. A couple of other studies, this one from Dr. Weir, showing in the first phase, the correction of hyperkalemia, as you can see here for four weeks, very nice correction in the first few days of administration. Another interesting point is the drop, is the drug, is the drop was more significant in those who were started with higher levels of hyperkalemia. And then they sort of converge and, and then it was maintained nicely in those who were kept on patiromer and those who and, um, and those who were withdrawn, the potassium rose predictably back to hyperkalemic levels. Again, showing the efficacy over a period of four weeks in this study. And then this is the study by uh, led by Dr. George Backris with the same team. Uh, this was not a placebo-controlled trial. It was a patiromer administered in patients with mild and moderate hyperkalemia. Again, showing that the strategy works and normalizing potassium happened quickly here and throughout the follow-up of 52 weeks. So that's a one-year study. And these patients were maintained in a normal kalemic range. And then once the medication was withdrawn, the levels increased again back to close to the hyperkalemic ranges. This is a post hoc subgroup analysis aimed to evaluate the effectiveness of pateromer in patients who were older uh, on RAS inhibition uh, with CKD, type 2 diabetes, and hypertension. Pateromer resulted in significant decreases in serum potassium levels after four weeks, and this lasted through 52 weeks. Pateromer was effective in um, lowering uh, serum potassium and was well tolerated in this older cohort. So in general, the treatment was considered to be safe, although remember we talked about 600 inpatients, so there were rare events which may not show up in these biochemical efficacy studies. What came up is mainly GI side effects, perhaps as expected given the mechanism of action uh, of the agent, uh, and also constipation, flatulence. And then there's the interesting one, which is hypomagnesemia, um, which, you know, patiromer may not be completely as specific for potassium binding. It may bind other cations too. However, it is noted that no clinical side effects of hypomagnesemia, such as muscle cramps or paresthesias, or even malignant arrhythmias were recorded in these trials. So this is another study looking at dialysis patients, only six patients though. Uh, you could see uh, on the upper right-hand corner, you see the serum potassium values over time during the pretreatment week and the pateromer treatment weeks, and the hemodialysis treatments are indicated by arrow. Aside from lowering serum potassium, it is interesting that it also, pateromer also decreased serum phosphorus levels. And um, note that all phosphate binders were discontinued on the Sunday of uh, being involved in the trial. And the second um, drug I would review with you is the clinical trials published by ZS or zirconium cyclosilicate. So there were two large trials with a total number of about 1,000 patients. Again, concept is the same. Essentially, the patient population was slightly different with, no, uh, common, with uh, commonly being patients with hyperkalemia, but not limited to CKD. Uh, there's a fairly rapid correction of hyperkalemia. And you could see on the graph, this is hours here on the x-axis. And as you can see, with three consecutive administrations of 10 gram dose, and then further decrease here in the normal range. And then when these patients were allocated to different strengths of the binder, you saw that there's a dose-dependent separation of the serum potassium levels, depending on which group use uh, which strength. Now, a second study used a similar concept, 
um, and and again, um, during a long term, longer term follow up, this is for twenty one days, so three weeks. There was separation between patients who were withdrawn and those put on placebo, and those patients develop redevelop hyperkalemia, while those patients who were maintained on CS maintained normal kalemia. Um, this is a paper we published in CJSON. Um, for those patients treated with ZS, once they became normal K-limit, um, they can be given individual doses of ZS. And this was associated with maintenance of normal k without any need for substantial changes in the dose of the RAS inhibitors. This study was for 12 months. And then this is an open label extension of the uh, second study I showed, which is the harmonized study, showing that majority of the patients maintained serum potassium within the normal kalemic range, um, again, during the ongoing uh, treatment. This is an exploratory analysis examining the serum bicarbonate in urea, as well as urine pH from the three uh, ZS papers. And here uh, we looked at the uh, effect on serum bicarbonate and it showed that ZS actually increased serum bicarbonate concentrations and decreased the proportion of patients with serum bicarb less than 22. And this is likely due to the binding of ZS with ammonium in the gut. Uh, this is the dialyzed study, a double-blind placebo-controlled phase 3B multicenter trial, dialysis patients, where uh, they, they received uh, ZS uh, once daily on non-dialysis days or placebo. And the primary efficacy outcome here was the proportion of patients during the four-week stable dose evaluation period who actually maintained pre-dialysis potassiums between four and five um, or did not require urgent rescue therapy to reduce serum potassium. So the problem uh, that was the side effect um, of uh, ZS was the occurrence of edema in, um, and this is uh, believed to be related to the sodium exchange. Um, so um, half of the patients did not require a change in treatment though, and most of them uh, completed the ZS study. And the reason why there is peripheral edema, not pulmonary edema, uh, is because the potassium is likely exchanged for sodium. So there could be an addition of sodium load that is more in patients who require higher dose of the binder. So this is a nice uh, algorithm that shows you where uh, the management of hyperkalemia, you could see the acute management and then the chronic management. And you could see where the uh, novel oral potassium binders fit. Um, this is a, just a nice table um, comparing the different binders. You have your SPS on the left side, ZS in the middle, and pateromer. And you could see how they are compared as far as their mechanism of action. Uh, again, another table uh, just showing you select characteristics of these potassium binders. So in conclusion, um, what we can, you know, there are, times we're in our reaction whenever we see a patient on RAS inhibition uh, who develop hyperkalemia is either we yank up the RAS inhibitor or stop the, or give a lower dose. But nowadays we have an option to actually add this novel oral potassium binding agents to RAS inhibitors. And there are studies that support this, that now perhaps we can use these medications. Uh, there, um, one of the studies which I uh, did not show is the AMBER study actually were in patients with resistant hypertension uh, were given spironolactone as the fourth line agent for resistant hypertension. And in addition to that was given pateromer. And although the effect on the blood pressure was not significant, it showed uh, proof of concept that you can give these patients binders and you can patients can tolerate the RAS inhibitor. And 
my last three slides, uh, I just want to share again. Um, this is something that we have been doing on social media. So everybody here has an iPhone, iPad, or a tablet, or what have you, an Android. And you're all familiar with the emojis, right? There's an anatomically correct emoji for the, for the brain, for the heart, for the lungs. But there's no kidney emoji, right? There's no kidney emoji. And so we have this campaign. Um, of, um, which is supported by various organizations uh, of nephrology. Uh, this is only uh, uh, an example. Uh, there are more organizations uh, as part of this support. Uh, we actually published a, a, a sort of a, an editorial in AJKD in the last issue. Uh, and so we encourage everybody to join our campaign uh, by going on on this website. With that, I say thank you very much for your attention. Dr. Lerma, hi, Keith Armitage, Department of Medicine. I want to thank you for our really superb Grand Rounds. It's a fitting end to our season. This is our last Grand Rounds of the academic year. Um, I want to thank Dr. Jitterat. She, she's invited several fantastic speakers. Um, I was talking to two of our residents this morning who are going into nephrology, and they thought, oh, they, they I think, compared you to a nephrology rock star. So thank you so much. We're, we're, we're over time, about five minutes. I don't know any anybody want to any other questions or comments. There's a joke in the ID world. If you ask two ID doctors an antibiotic question, you get three answers. I don't know if there's any, any nephrologists who want to. Uh, if not, Doctor, I want to again thank you for being flexible on the time. This is a fantastic talk, really important topic. I think our residents and other trainees benefited greatly. That it's something we encounter all the time in the hospital, and. Um, and this ends the 21-22 uh, academic year Grand Rounds calendar. So thank you again for everyone participating. Thank you, Dr. Lerma. It's uh, 106. And everyone have a good afternoon.